Today, on How It's Made. Ropes. We all need something to hang on to. Billiard tables. We had to pool our resources to bring you this story. Sailboards. We take you to a cool factory we got wind of. And symbols. Making them is a smashing job. Years ago, people went to great lengths to make rope. They stretched yarn two to three hundred meters, sometimes down alleys, and secured it on hooks. Then they turned wheels to rotate the hooks, twisting the yarn into rope. This technique was called a rope walk. Luckily today, we have machines to do all the legwork. These ropes are made from thousands of nylon fibers that are finer than human hair, but stronger. To make rope, yarns wind around aluminum cylinders, pulled by a turning spool down the line. Then, three at a time, the yarns roll over another spool that applies a protective coating of urethane. Then they funnel through a distribution plate that holds them evenly apart. This ensures they're at an even tension as a rocking spool twists them into one larger yarn. This machine is called the Whirlwind. It twists the yarn and then winds it onto a take-up spool inside. A little arm moves back and forth, guiding the yarn so it winds evenly onto the spool. This is core yarn, and it'll be used to make other rope. Now, dozens of spools of nylon fiber unwind at the same time to make jackets to protect the core yarns. The fibers travel several meters over a network of rollers that act as guides and control tension on each individual fiber. They pass through distribution plates as turning bobbins below twist the fibers into yarn. The platform moves up and down to evenly wind the yarn onto the bobbin. They place 48 of these bobbins on the maypole machine, so-called because the braiding action resembles a dance around a traditional maypole. The bobbins spin and zigzag around each other as a machine pulls core yarn up through the center. Here you can see the rope being braided around the core yarn as it's pulled up through a die. This is the braiding action in slow motion. It produces a mountain climbing rope, strong yet stretchy because of the twist in the core of the rope. The rope winds onto the wheel as it pulls it upwards, then it spills into a basket. A worker pulls out a sample rope to check its flexibility and strength. He bends it to make sure it'll knot easily. Now another maypole braider weaves a synthetic rope that's stronger than steel, yet lightweight and flexible. That's because the strands at the core are braided with a material called ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene. It's a high-performance thermoplastic. This rope will be used for advanced yachting. A pulley draws this high-tech rope through some metal pipes filled with steam. This shrinks the polyester jacket around the powerful core for a tight fit. These dancing bobbins do some fancy moves to produce different weaves around core ropes. They dip around and between each other in a choreographed sequence. But there are no worries about production hitting a snarl. If a yarn breaks, the machine simply shuts down. It takes 8 to 10 hours to make a bit more than 900 meters of this large utility rope. Now for the strength test. They loop a sample piece of rope around steel posts. This one is a nylon double braid, the type used for dock lines on boats. Hydraulic pressure pulls the rope upwards, while a computerized gauge measures the tension and detects the breaking point. Over 9,000 kilograms. That's the weight of a killer whale. Needless to say, this twine is just fine. Now for another test. They insert a steel probe, known as a FID, into some industrial rope, then place the pointed end into a hole. An electric motor forces the FID through, 
while a gauge measures the force it takes for it to completely penetrate the rope. It took four and a half kilograms of pressure to push the probe through the rope, which means this rope is firm yet flexible. So now you really know the ropes about rope. The game of billiards has been around, in one form or another, for nearly 500 years. During the 19th century, the game's rules and equipment evolved to basically what they are today. Billiards, also known as pool, is played on a slate tabletop covering a wood frame that's usually 2.5 meters long and 1.2 meters wide. Clients order billiard tables much like they would custom-designed furniture. They pick the table's style, colors, the type of wood, and its lacquer and stain. The table comes in maple, walnut, mahogany, cherry, and the most popular, oak. A computer-guided machine shapes part of what'll be the table's frame. This machine's rotating heads perform several different tasks. A profiling head carves the angle of part of the frame. A routering head creates the table's decorative grooves and a drilling head makes holes for bolts to fit through. Six wood components, called rails, will surround the playing surface. They have diamond-shaped carvings that'll become visual markers for the players. After spraying the rails with glue, a worker inserts 18 metal nuts. They'll be used later to secure the rails to the playing surface. He attaches rubber strips along the sticky rails, which are just over one meter long. The rubber will cushion the balls when they hit the sides. The rails then pass through a press twice to ensure the rubber adheres. Next, workers move the rails along this 9 meter long sanding machine. Rubber wheels gently grip each rail as presses rub sandpaper along the edge and top. They skip the bottom because it'll be covered. They pass the rails through this sander several times to smooth them down. To make sure everything fits, a worker pre-assembles the four sides and the middle section of the frame's base. He uses 20 metal bolts and 20 nuts to join them. And he inserts eight wooden dowels in order to align the table parts correctly. He stamps numbers on the frame sections so they can be reassembled later by pairing the same numbered parts together. Next, a worker hot glues 18 2.5 cm long mother of pearl components called sights. He fits them into the carvings on the rails, which have now been stained to the desired shade. He taps them into place using a hammer and a block made of synthetic resin. This way, he won't damage the rail. A worker then lines the rubber part of the rail with cloth made of wool and nylon. He attaches it with a plastic strip that fits over the cloth and into a groove. He uses a mallet to ensure the cloth is tightly inserted. The worker then staples the cloth to the other side of the rail. A zinc and brass plaque displays the table's brand name. After shipping, workers reassemble the table in its new home. Serial numbers ensure the parts belong to the same table. Assembly takes about two hours. They match the numbered parts together using up to 50 bolts and 50 nuts. Then they level the table using metal components called leg levelers to adjust the table's height. It's like sticking a matchbook under an uneven table leg. Now comes the really heavy lifting. Workers fit the three sections of the table's top, which are made of slate and weigh up to 136 kilograms each. Slate won't degrade and it won't budge if you hit it. The workers use 12 screws to attach the slate sections to the frame. They level the sections using wedge-shaped plastic shims between the slate and the frame. Next, a worker melts wax over the cracks between the sections. He uses a scraper to smooth out the playing surface. The remaining holes will later be covered by rails. After the wax dries, they cover the table surface with cloth, which comes in a variety of colors. They cut the cloth in the corners so there won't be any creases in the lining of the pocket holes. They staple the cloth to wood strips under the slate. 
the worker pierces the cloth over the holes in the slate so he can later attach the rails. The six pockets are 15 centimeters deep and consist of a metal frame covered with a leather lattice. Workers install 18 threaded metal rods underneath the rails. Then they flip the rail assembly and insert the rods through pre-made holes in the tabletop. They use nuts to secure the rods in place. Screws attach the pockets and voila, your table is ready. For prices ranging between $1,500 and $15,000, you have quite a stylish game. Just watch out for the sharks. American Newman Darby built the first sailboards during the 1960s. He rigged a sail to a mast on a board with a tail fin and rode the wind and waves. Today's windsurfers can pay several thousand dollars for their high-tech gear. This includes a sail, a mast, and a sailboard. To make a sailboard, workers start with a long block of styrofoam. They attach a wood template, pushing nails through holes in the wood and into the block. Using an electrically heated tool, called a hot wire, they slice the block along the curved line of the template. The result is what's known as the core. They use styrofoam because it's lightweight and buoyant. Next, a worker guides what's known as a shaper machine. It outlines a template, called a masterboard, on the left, while a spindle cuts grooves into the core on the right. The grooves are guidelines to carve the core into the shape of the masterboard later on. The shaper's 18 kilogram counterweight lets the spindle gently hover above the core as it cuts. Styrofoam dust flies everywhere, so the worker wears a protective mask to avoid inhaling it. A worker then saws along the grooves to reveal the initial shape of the sailboard. Another worker then sands down the core. Next, he applies 650 grams of epoxy resin onto carbon fabric to reinforce the material and make it sticky. Another worker applies resin on fiberglass fabric. These strong, lightweight materials are part of the board's fabric and foam sandwich construction. They'll harden inside molds of the board's top and bottom sections during curing later on. The workers carefully scrape away about 20% of the resin. Too much, and the board could crack during use. Here the worker spreads thicker resin onto a 3 mm thick piece of rigid foam. He places it into the bottom mold and attaches a hand-sized plastic component called a fin box. It'll hold the sailboard's fin, which helps the user steer. They add Kevlar, an ultra-lightweight synthetic fabric, as the final outer layer on the core's bottom side. After applying resin to another piece of rigid foam, a worker cuts openings through which other components will later fit. This layer is placed into the top mold and covered with more carbon fabric. Next, a worker places the core into the bottom mold. He fits two plastic components, called foot strap inserts, into openings lined with fiberglass fabric to secure them. Another plastic component, called a mass track, fits through an opening lined with a stronger carbon fabric. The track will later anchor a mast measuring up to six meters high. Strips of carbon fabric also reinforce the areas where the windsurfer will stand. Workers join the mold sections and insert the whole thing into a plastic sack called a vacuum bag. They tape the end shut, but leave two smaller holes open. They attach two hoses to collars in these holes. An electric pump then takes about three minutes to suck all the air out of the bag. As the air is removed, pressure forces the mold sections even closer together. After curing in an oven at 38 degrees Celsius for five hours, workers separate the mold sections. Using a rotary grinder, a worker trims away excess hardened fabric and foam along the edge. The whole board got a coat of primer earlier, but now a worker sands the paint off along the edge. They place a strip of carbon fabric all the way around the edge and secure it with thin plastic wrap. 
After more curing, the wrapping is removed and the board is sealed for good. Next, the sailboard gets two coats of urethane paint. A worker locates the foot strap insert holes and cleans them out with a router bit. He uses a router to clean the inside of the mass track opening. An enormous vinyl sticker gives the board its personality. A worker smooths away any air bubbles. Then, after inscribing the sailboard's dimensions and serial number, he signs the board. Finally, workers glue on two rubber cushions called deck pads. For $1,900, you've got the foundation of a very cool gliding machine. The clash of the symbol reverberates down through time. History tells us that symbols were used in Israel in 1100 BC. Over the centuries, the finest symbols have been manufactured in Turkey with a secret method for blending metals. And those time-honored techniques still resound in symbol making today. If you want to drum up a little excitement, nothing can beat the symbol. Each symbol has its own character, resulting in subtle differences in tone. To make symbols, they start with castings. In this case, they're made of a secret blend of copper, tin, and trace amounts of silver. A worker sorts them by weight. Then a moving tray that's powered hydraulically takes them to a rotary oven. 815 degrees Celsius heat softens the castings and then workers shovel them into a rolling mill. It squeezes them between two big metal cylinders and the effect is the same as rolling out pie crust. The castings become thinner, flatter and larger. These castings go through a heating and rolling cycle up to 12 times depending on the type of symbol being made. The repeated heating and cross-rolling creates a dense interlocking weave in the granular structure of the alloy. It'll make the symbol strong enough to take a real beating. The interlocking weave will also help transmit sound waves more rapidly across the symbol. After the symbol has been tempered and pressed into its final shape, they place it on a spindle. While it spins, circular cutters shear the edges to a set diameter. Next, the symbol takes a pounding. A hydraulic engine powers this hammering cylinder, and a computer program directs the force. These impressions will enrich the symbol's sound by changing the path of the sound waves. Next, it's time to start grooving, as in tonal grooves. This craftsman puts the symbol on a lathe, bottom side forward. The symbol spins on an axle, while the lathing blade cuts into it. He starts with a handheld lathing tool, and then switches to one that's mounted on the machine. Lathing removes the symbol's outer layer and carves those important tonal grooves into it. The depth and positioning of the grooves will vary depending on the type of symbol being produced. He lays the top of the symbol entirely by hand so he can better control the amount of pressure applied. Watch those fingers. Don't worry, he knows what he's doing. He's honed his skills over five years of apprenticeship and no automatic machine can duplicate the fine touch of an experienced symbol craftsman. Now he removes the newly grooved symbol and puts it on an edging machine. A big round metal clamp locks the symbol in place. It spins while a cutting tool smooths out the edge of the symbol. Here's a before and after shot. The ragged rim is before edging. The smoother one at the bottom is after. This guy has the best job. He's in charge of quality assurance.
That means he tests each symbol before it's sent out into the marketplace. He's listening for a range of sounds. Now, a laser etches the trademark into the symbol. It also engraves a unique serial number. Next, a silicon pad sponges up ink from a print plate and transfers it to the symbol. Now that the company logo is on, it's ready for shipping anywhere in the world. But this rough metal casting has already come a long way. It's been transformed into a smooth, sleek symbol over a total of 21 days. And that's reason enough to strike up the band. If you have any comments about the show, or if you'd like to suggest topics for future shows, drop us a line at www.howitismade.net. <laughs>